This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much, Adam, for the kind introduction. And uh, um, I have never been in Ithaca. And it's a place that every plant scientist wants to be and want to visit, right, at least. So dream come true. So here, why there's two screens? Oh, OK. All right, OK. Um, so I should tell you, maybe you haven't heard. There is, um, this is being uh, videoed remotely. OK. And videotaped. So um, remote screen is seeing this. But OK, all right, OK. So today I'm going to talk about three uh, aspect of uh, my research here, and one is the Center for Plant Transformation at Iowa State University, which is basically a service center. And then my research aspect in the agrobacteria, and as well as uh, nanoparticle um, delivery, uh, non-DNA molecule delivery in plant. So um, a lot of stuff there, and then there's a few slides that maybe rush through, and I apologize apologize for that if uh, you get confused of uh, uh, stuff. So first of all, talking about the plant transformation facility at Iowa State University, which was established 20 years ago. Um, 1995, I um, left my industry job where um, I used to be colleague with Joss Rose, so, um, and from uh, ICI GOST, and moved to Iowa State University, take a position to run a plant transformation facility. Um, that time, the facility was uh, basically was supported by endowment uh, grant from uh, agronomy, uh, and then the commodity group, which heavily behind that, and then also from administrative uh, uh, unit of uh, uh, the cows and uh, plant biotechnology. It's a very similar situation like today that uh, we've been talking about. So currently, um, we have five permanent staff, uh, I cannot, four times staff here. Um, we have a corn transformation specialist, soybean transformation specialist, rice transformation specialist, and they all, one person, start from the very beginning to the end of the entire pipeline. Um, they do not have hourly students. They work everything alone, just simple one person project. And then we have a lab manager who does some molecular biology work, and then we have a greenhouse, dedicated greenhouse manager who do nothing but taking care of corn and soybean and rice plant. <coughs> so this, together with myself, we um, run the, the, um, the, the corn and soybean transformation. We have only three crop focused, a very focused project on that. Um, our transformation facility is under a plant science institute, which is a umbrella institute, uh, covers the following centers, uh, genomics, bioinformatics, um, plant transformation, breeding, and, and the, the other few two uh, centers. So we operate a somewhat autonomy, autonomous, but at the same time we get support from plant science institute. And then we also under the umbrella of the Office of Biotechnology, which runs all the infrastructure and the centralizing um, uh, the facility, genomic informatics, flow cytometry, hybridoma, um, microscope, nano image, and all these things are very similar to here. So there's a, we are the one of the 12 core facility. So these two units support uh, collectively one full time, um, one FTE. So over the past 20 years, um, we have served 35 internal crop group and basically corn, soybean, rice uh, and, uh, uh, faculty researchers. And then we have 161 external groups from 121 institution, institution from 16 countries. So basically, everybody who does corn and soybean, not rice, rice a lot of people can do themselves, corn and soybean, come to our facility, majority, at least 70 to 80% of the research in the field does that, from a, uh, receive service from us. So here is a summary of the growth, all our capacity, to the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, of over the year of our growth. And as you can see at the beginning, 
uh, we creeping through all the numbers and we didn't know we didn't know anybody and then nobody knows us and then after all these years and then we are reaching really our capacity for three staff members of course we can add more people if they um, but the cost we want to keep down is we keep really quality staff our staff are really very experienced they are PhD level of uh, um, uh, uh, scientist and then so they provide service they at the same time they always tweaking the conditions always comparing different um, uh, parameters so for here the home transformation just shows how uh, the plant in our greenhouse look like and I really admire um, Cornell's greenhouse crew uh, this afternoon I to the greenhouse I just I can't say enough of good things about it's just so clean and so well organized and then you have those incubator was 60 70 uh, uh, 1970s vintage and then well well kept which means that they say well it's a very energy costing unit but they are so well maintained uh, you know a yeah, lot of a uh, unit a lot of uh, institution you will see instrument cannot keep more than five years because nobody take care of them they just get you know rotten and then be abused by the student and then all the things but here it's a really amazing infrastructure for the growth and uh, really great so we do two type of uh, a major transformation and then high two and then b104 high two is a lab line and then which is not very good for um, agronomic purpose but it's uh, good enough for study some basic things and then transformation is easy that's why uh, high 2 has been the working horse in our lab and then but later on we were able to get a b104 transformation then b104 is a quite good inbred and it's a, a major uh, inbred um, based on the b73 so a lot of genomics can be done with this um, a B104. However, the transformation frequency for these two crops varies a lot, uh, which can the cost the difference in the price as well. So when sometimes uh, the faculty like to use B104 for transformation, but the price why they couldn't afford, and that's one of the another things. When you are working with very recalcitrant crop, and sometimes you have to face the price issue. For soybean transformation, and the half seed method was actually invented during the time when I, uh, after the um, uh, arrived Iowa State University, and soybean transformation patent has been um, uh, established long time in the late 80s, but you know still very very low frequency and very difficult to transfer a technique to the other person. Uh, you have to be really well versed with cell biology in order to run it. So um, my effort, uh, this invention particularly, is scale transfer friendly. Means that you know some of those basic uh, uh, knowledge, uh, if a, a high school student was able to uh, understand the protocol and then do exactly what was demonstrated, they are able to achieve transgenic soybean. So. The skill um, is not really quite uh, the important for the people to have. So that's very important if you want to have your technology um, expanded and then be uh, benef benefiting uh, more than only just one your lab. And so soybean transformation, we uh, have this protocol and the. Uh, it's wor working very well, but it's uh, very it, to our capacity. So then, finally, it's a rice transformation, which we uh, basically do the Japonica rice transformation, both in the Bombay and then Kataki, using the pretty standard and public uh, uh, protocol, and works very well. But I think the rice is not as difficult uh, compared to uh, recalcitrant corn and then soybean here and most people can actually establish for themselves. So what is a key limitation with our facility? After 10, uh, 20 years of uh, working on uh, this service facility, and I would say first of all is the lack of uh, our greenhouse space. So basically we have only 3,000 square 
feet, and probably the really the gross space is less than that. The 3,000 square feet in this case is wall-to-wall -wall space. Um, then according to um, uh, the Andy and for the greenhouse and analysis, these are much less. Um, we have to grow corn year round in order to provide the starting material, which is the immature embryo. And then we have to grow soybean to the maturity in order to get the seeds for the delivery. So we used to grow transgenic corn to seeds for the customer. Now we cannot afford anymore and because there's no space simply. And we just have to beg all our uh, colleagues um, to take the greenhouse, to, to take the uh, transgenic plantlet and grow in your own greenhouse. This is a very difficult for overseas business. And for Germany, for Austria, for Belgium, we can do that. We successfully sending all these transgenic plantlet across uh, uh, Atlanta, no problem. But when we want to send to Mexico, even on the same continent, we, we, we face a very, very challenging customer issue. And that's really just basically we cannot um, overcome things we cannot control over. So, uh, and then another major issue is recruit and retain high quality staff. Um, I have three staff which was, has been with me for 20 years and 10, 20 years. Um, we have a lot of young staff going through and then two or three years later they are gone for a variety of reasons. Um, and a lot of industry does re try to uh, recruit our staff because we do provide very good training. And at the same time, and because there's no such a training from master degree or whatever undergraduate cell biology anymore. So we uh, seldom can find anybody who is able to jump into the transformation and then um, take a, taking project and go. So that's why our um, staff has been steady, but at the same time we become worried because we are getting old. We, we don't get any younger. We need to have a next generation who is able to do the same job or even better than us. Uh, so those are the issues we are all facing. Every facility, uh, public institution facing that, same as um, Pioneer. So I think we need to build a robot. So um, <laughs> I, I'm not joking when I'm saying this because the camera imaging system and computer system can allow us to identify the type of a characteristic, allow us to pick those type of the thing, recognize and uh, pick them. Why not? So the next thing, if you want to think about reducing transformation costs, we have to invest into working with mechanical engineering, computer scientists, um, and then cell biology, and then to build up a, a robot that will do the job. Otherwise, you will always cry. And 20 years ago, I think this, I thought this would be solved. By now, 20 years later, I'm still facing this issue. So, okay, instead of a, a yeah, crying over, we probably think creatively uh, using the new technology, let's build something we can do uh, transformation fast. Because sequencing, think about sequencing. 20 years or 30 years ago, we had to sequence ourselves manually. This revolutionized our sequencing capacity. I never imagined this could happen, but um, that's a reality now. So because of limited uh, staff and a limited uh, infrastructure and restrict our ability to, to research to improve transformation frequency. And then at the beginning of our establishment facility, I was able to actually working to improve eff efficiency. But then when we become a popular, we are so overwhelmed by all these orders. We have no time and we have no material even to use for research. So that's, that's major issues. At every facility, they want to start their um, uh, service. They have to include the research component in, into that. So that's how much about uh, transformation service part and I can afford to talk about it. I'm sure we are going to talk about it a little bit more in detail. And, but I want to um, come to the second aspect of my 
research on the uh, non-coding RNA in egg bacteria. So I grew up with agrobacteria. That's my graduate study, and I was thrown into agrobacteria world. And but after my PhD postdoc, I totally sick and tired of agrobacteria. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I just want to use that to transform plant. So because also partially, I thought agrobacteria, everybody's know every bit of agrobacteria anymore. There's nothing left for us to study. So, um, but back now, six, 10 years ago, six, uh, seven years ago, I had a very weird conversation with Stan Galvin, and we, uh, uh, we, we have worked on the NSF project, and then and I have a conversation with Luis Herrera, um, who was uh, uh, my, my peer um, colleague in a, a graduate student time about agrobacteria. We were asking, how much do we really know about agrobacteria? And do we really know every gene of agrobacteria? If people try to know, uh, knock out every single gene of Arabidopsis, I don't know if anybody has knocked out every single gene of ag uh, agrobacteria in order to know uh, the, the, uh, the function of the gene and then to see if we can use this organism and for any more uh, transformation frequency improvement. So that's why we started a, a, a random project. It was uh, let's just sequencing the transcriptome of that because everybody was sequencing something. So, okay. <laughs> Seriously, and plus I have a good friend in Illumina. What do you know, right? <laughs> you got to have friends in important place. And then they said, well, just threw me in with this. I just run it for you. And wow, that's, that's why, okay? You know, with no support, and then that's your know, friend who, who, who will help you to float, right? So. See, this is Illumina's colleague's uh, name on that. We uh, designed the experiment together, and at that time, even Illumina never had dealt with uh, bacterial uh, transcriptome. So it's very exciting for them too. So we published uh, one, uh, we just used their very new technology that time, and then managed to identify a lot of, uh, uh, so we had a total of 840, uh, eight, 48 billion million reads. So it's a very high throughput compared to 454 that time. 454 still is an important workhorse. So my friend there is saying that, okay, look, we can generate a lot more reads for you, right? So yeah, so we got a lot of those uh, data and we uh, use our, uh, we worked with our uh, bio um, informatics uh, uh, professor and uh, colleague on campus and to was able to uniquely map, uh, uh, to take the uniquely mapped uh, um, transcriptome. So the first thing that we try to evaluate is that, okay, we check our vir operon. Virence, virence operon is one of, uh, uh, a group of a gene which is very important for agrobacterial media transformation, DNA transformation, because they, they will only activate during the time they interact with plant. So acyl syringer is a plant signal molecule which induces this agrobacterial gene come out. So when you see these red peaks, those are the VIR gene which induced by agrobacterial, uh, by the plant signal molecule acyl syringer, and blue are the no inducers. So when you look at all these um, uh, transcriptomes, they say, well, yeah, hey, that's really what we have known for all these years. These are very highly induced, and some of them are not. And then to our surprise that we find there's a bunch of six antisense, which sometimes non-induced, sometimes induced, and then that you know, immediately was very interesting for us because the cis antisense uh, on the VIR, on this inducible important gene, what are they, right? So then we characterize most of those um, uh, identified non-coding RNA. They are range from a, um, zero to 521 nucleotide and average length of 88, 88 nucleotide and a median length 61. That's their characteristic. And then 
88% of the small RNA are on two chromosomes, which is not surprising. Um, in agrobacteria, they have a big circular chromosome and linear chromosome, and then two plasmids. And the TI plasmid is the one is most important to us for the plant transformation because uh, the tDNA, the, 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 uh, the transfer DNA is on this plasmid and via gene is on this plasmid. So then 87% of antisense RNA are on the two plasmids and 18 are on the complementary strand of VABDEFK. So, those are the characteristics which we found is quite interesting. So then the first thing we, uh, the next thing we were asking is that, okay, cis antisense. Um, easily you could think cis antisense probably are regulating the, 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 the strand opposite to theirs, right? So do they have really targeting trans or what? So then we did this uh, analysis on transcriptome and we found out they actually do not correlate. So the expression of the opposite strand, opposite strand of a tr uh, the, the, the gene, uh, the transcript, transcripts, they are not correlated with that particular expression of the antisense, I mean the, uh, the, the cis small RNA. So what they are doing? Um, so one of my students, and Abby Johnson, and uh, decided to focus on that uh, uh, the small RNA opposite to via C and uh, C1 and C2 gene on the TI plasmid. So if you look at this uh, via opera, and you will notice most of via genes on the opposite strand, on the top strand. And C1 and C2 are the two gene, which only these two on the opposite strand. So itself is already weird. And this C1, C2 has a very strong expression of antisense in this case. So what is C? What is the VSC opera? Do we know anything about this? Yes, we, there's a bunch of study have done uh, a while ago. Um, so I never paid attention to VSC1 and C2 because I think from literature, people always think that, yeah, it doesn't really abolishing the the pathogenesis or virulence, it's rather just attenuates. I don't know, do you agree on that? So the, all this um, uh, publication just says that, yeah, it's lead to reduced. So during my time, and if anything is not black and white, I was not interested in it. It has to be black and white, and that's easy, right? You can publish Science Nature black and white. And if it's in between, uh, you don't go very far. So. But a lot of things, uh, it's in between, right? You know, so, it, and then uh, you look at the VRC um, transcript, you will, see, you will see their transcript, the C1 transcript is highly induced by Esson Syringer. You can see the red peak come out. But via C2 seem to be not very enthusiastic after induction, at least in the condition we have been testing over, over time, via C2 is always very low peak, yeah? So then you look at the anti via C2, and then you see that region, the opposite strand, you see a lot of expression. This anti C2 is predominantly exactly opposite of C2 and then there's not much of NTC1. So there is this transcriptome wide of, uh, you know, correlation. And so that's a pattern we are, we are seeing, okay? So the hypothesis is, okay, VSC2 antisense is maybe regulating VSC2 sense. And maybe that contribute to the low frequency or low expression. So then we did some correlation analysis, expression analysis, so we found out the VRC2 and anti-VRC2 actually correlated very well. When you have a more VRC2, you have a more anti-C2. This, look at this correlation, it's very well correlated. And doesn't look like the expression of anti-VRC2 downregulates VRC2. In this case, it's like, a, the more of this and more of that, it's like more of a stabilizer rather than you know destabilizer. I don't know. So that's a thing we are still addressing. Okay. 
So then Abby did some knockout because studied antisense small RNA is very difficult because if you, you cannot delete them. You delete them, you delete the, the, the gene opposite, right? So you can't really delete gene. You cannot knock out using conventional way. So Abby tried to look at the, uh, the upstream of this anti-VSC2. They, he, she found that there's a, a putative promoter region of this. So she then mess up a little bit of the promoter region, delete that part. So just delete a little bit of this area and see what happened. So after deletion, and then she found her anti-VSC2 transcript reduce. Her VSC2 transcript reduce as well. So the correlation still goes. You know, when you reduce VSC2 antisense, you reduce C2. So it seemed to be there is this still, you know, um, positive correlation instead of a negative uh, down-regulates that there's something VSC, anti-VSC2, the function, I don't, I still don't know what is that, right? So the so possible com uh, explanation is antisense VSC2 is bind to the sense transcript and stabilize and uh, uh, stabilize it po uh, post-transcriptionally and, and then could be the regulation of the C2 is uh, during the transcription. Uh, so the, some of those things are still not very clear. So then the, another things we want to do is uh, say, okay, after you mess around this anti-VSC2 region, do you, inf do you get this virulence um, level down or do you have any impact on virulence? So that's the first thing usually agrobacteria people always do that when you mess around with a strain, you first want to see, okay, did you make any impact on the virulence? So then uh, in this case, we use this uh, Kalanqui uh, model plant or, or a typical uh, assay system that we use for agrobacteria virulence assay. So Abby inoculate the two strains. One is her deletion mutation, one is a wire type on uh, this Kalanqui leaf. And then, you know, after two weeks, and she assay for the tumors, and then she sees this, you know, um, reduced, reduced phenotype of her strain. And the wild type has a lot of tumor, the, 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 uh, this mutant strain does not. So it's very nice. But when you look at the mall, you see it's all over the place. And this is the best representative. If you just publish that, you say, oh my God, it's great. But we know better now after 30 years. And we know these things, we cannot just say, oh, here, yeah, this is what we expect. And we do see a lot of difference. And so that's where uh, the complication is. OK, do we really see the true attenuation, or it's just a random plant response to the virus, right? So, well, because we don't have anything better than just do a lot. And so we start to do a lot. And at the same time, we just define the uh, virulence uh, by zero, no response at all, then a little bit of response to number one, and then two and three. So those are the things where uh, the typically we just uh, qualitatively characterize. So then after that, we, then we again then uh, count how many of number one, two, three, four. And then and then, then you measure those, uh, and then you, 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 you see how many of those are actually from uh, uh, score the zero, and how many score one, and how many score three. So it looks like here, the wire type and score zero, you have a less of a wire type, you have a more of a mutant strain scored um, uh, zero. And then you have a, a more of a wire type score number three. So this is still very qualitative. And then she did uh, a statistic analysis on this uh, man Whitney rank summer test using this for that. And then um, so she has a hypothesis is the mean ranks of two samples are same, or the alternate hypothesis is the mean rank of two samples are different. So according to her analysis here is uh, the hypothesis, alternate hypothesis is probably uh, true here. 
So, you know, it's again, to us, it's, I do not really, I, I, it, 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 when I read this data, I say, oh yeah, you know, there's probably difference, but you know, do they, do they really tell us anything? So, but most important things we want to study is what really that anti-C2 is doing C, uh, uh, has an effect on C2 or any other uh, genes. So the, the subsequent uh, uh, the experiment we are doing right now is do this uh, RNA stabil uh, stabilization, uh, stability analysis, and then also use more of the quantitative analysis to see whether they, there is any uh, uh, variance uh, differences in, in these two different strains or different other uh, uh, small RNA. So we have other small RNA also in the works. A lot of them are actually affecting the quorum sensing and the conjugation and the sensitivity towards pH as well as temperature and those things. So as most of the non-coding RNA now finding, they are, are the fine tuning of the, their response to the environment. And I think that makes sense, uh, some of those bacterial fitness uh, affected by the um, the small RNA, all the small RNA is regulating the bacterial fitness in this case. So um, now to the third aspect of my talk is about uh, using the nanotechnology for the, uh, the non-DNA molecule delivery in this case. And this is a collaboration between my lab and with a group in chemistry department uh, in Iowa State University, and that was led by Victor Ling that time, and then he unfortunately passed away five years ago uh, in the middle of our collaborate, collaboration. And it was continued by two of his students. Um, uh, Brian Twain right now is a faculty in uh, Colorado School of Mine and, and continue the, uh, the nanoparticle research in this case. So, and that biological aspect of the experiment was done by my um, postdoc, Francois Tony, and then Susanna uh, Martin Otigosa. So, basically, at that time, and Dr. Ling have synthesized a material called mesoporocytical nanoparticle, which has a very interesting structure. Uh, it's a highly regulated material, and it does not found in the nature, and uh, uh, it's very stable. And most important is that inside there's a very large internal pore space allow you to uh, incorporate or upload payload pro protein or molecules that you want to carry uh, using this uh, particular uh, particle. So, um, and then this has also very interesting um, surface structure. You can really um, function, surface functionalize with a different molecule in order for it's for the different application purpose. And of course, uh, all this part, I'm not able to go detail with that. Uh, that's all very chemical for me. Uh, so one other aspect of this uh, silicon nanoparticle is that uh, you can feel it with a small molecule by simple diffusion, um, then you can co covalently attach the whole uh, pore uh, in this case, that uh, this molecule we put on the, to, to stop this leaky from a pore are uh, the gold small particle which covalently link to the surface of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the nanoparticle. And then upon change of pH or the induction of the um, uh, chemical in the, uh, the media, then you can open up the uh, pore and then have the uh, chem molecule release from inside. So that is a, this type of feature that I was interested in to use for the delivery for the plant molecule that I do not want to have them uh, immediately release that time. So back 2005, we started this uh, project and uh, in 2007, we succeeded to introduce um, a DNA introduce a DNA which is coated outside of the nanoparticle, but inside of the pore of a mesoporous nanoparticle, we load it with inducible chemical molecule. So when we shoot these two substances on the same um, nanoparticle into plant, and we will be able, we 
actually add reagent in the media and had the pore open, release the molecule inside of a mesoporous nanoparticle, and then get a gene expression uh, for, from the DNA that we introduced. So it was really the first case that we able to demonstrate that there is other way of uh, there was more than one way of introduce DNA or non-DNA uh, molecule into plants and then make them do the things that we want them to do. So uh, this will give us a lot of versatility uh, in a uh, lot of delivery. So what the MSN over the current transformation system can do is that it can deliver more than one biogenic species at a time. In our first uh, um, paper, we demonstrate that we can deliver a gene and an effector. And in fact, at that time, it was a chemical, uh, a chemical mo small chemical molecule. So then you have a, you can deliver gene and enzyme, you can deliver RNA and protein, you can deliver multiple substance in this case. And the advantage of use specific molecule for in this case is um, this molecule are encapsulated and you can control release. That's very important. Sometimes you don't want them to release all the time at all the stage. And then uh, uh, the other thing advantage of using this particular MSN is a surface can be functionalized to target a desired cell or tissue. So, and after this project uh, um, published, immediately, really, literally, the same day we get a phone call from Pioneer saying, well, can you deliver something else than DNA? I think, sure, why not? Um, so then they start to collaborate with us. Um, they, we said, well, no, we need to deliver a protein or recombinase in this case. CRISPR was not that time. Even talent wasn't even in the, uh, in, in the uh, research area as hot as today uh, yet. So their idea is, again, actually, um, Genome editing was not new at all back a long time ago that people has been always trying to find the way that we can specifically target um, a specific area uh, to make changes. So the protein delivery in genome editing time has some advantage over uh, the DNA delivery. It's a DNA-free technology. No need to create expression, expressing line, no need to segregate progeny. And transient activity could reduce toxicity and off-target mutations. And in some cases, I think it uh, does save time and an analysis. So the con, the disadvantage of that is you need to have a protein purified in this case. Purified DNA is a lot easier to purify protein and to get a lot of pur pur uh, pur protein available. And to assess the protein activity is not always easy and you can have protein quantity there, but you don't know if the protein has enzymatic activity that you want. And then uh, the efficiency comparing to DNA expression is, in our case, uh, low. And again, the last thing, the most important, is that after protein delivery, uh, how do you select those are uh, actually edited? Uh, so those are the issues and for protein delivery, but. You know, here is illustrate what's, uh, what we are uh, currently using. Our DNA delivery system, you have a plasmid, which carries nucleus in this case, and you do a, a regular genetic transformation. And after that, you will have the enzyme, and you have this enzyme work in the plant, and then made the plant change into the desired place you want. But that plant still carries enzyme, which you don't want. So to get rid of those enzymes, and typically what we do, we will do the self cross or the uh, cross pollination, self pollination or cross pollination. So then you have a segregation for the next generation, and then you will find out the uh, the plant. You use a PCR or an or other uh, method to identify those plants which has your edited genome, but do not carry the undesired nucleus gene anymore. So that is what currently we're doing. We're still doing that. So it's not too bad, but it can be done. So the ideal situation is that if we are able to just directly introduce the nucleus 
using MSN or use some other uh, delivery method and into the comb plant and one step you should get the edited plant but without your nucleus because protein will not last there. So that is ideal situation if we want to uh, get that. So okay, um, starting 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, we start to say, okay, can we deliver protein? Uh, we never tried the protein, honestly, until that time. So we purchased some EGFP and, and put them together with uh, the nanoparticle. And then we also try to code the nanoparticle with a DNA express alpha P, M cherry in this case. So we are looking for the cell, in this case, onion cell, which express both red and um, the uh, red and then have a green color. Uh, green is simply the presence of the uh, GFP release from the nanoparticle. Red has to be the DNA which carried uh, through the nanoparticle but express in this case. So we were able to do that. Immediately after that, we will say, okay, why don't we just start to try this rec recombinase? So Pioneer provided us with a Cray protein. We actually, you can buy it commercially, Cray protein. And then you load them onto the nanoparticle. In this case, I want to have to emphasize that part of the thing I did not um, talk about it is optimization of nanoparticle bombardment. Nanoparticle was made by silica. It's impossible to bombard silica, and that's just uh, uh, too light to be manipulated. So uh, our chemist group uh, managed to gold plated the silica with several layers of a gold particle. And then this is a silica before gold po um, uh, plating, and this is after six times of gold plating, the um, e, uh, TEM and SEM and uh, scanning microscope shows that. So, no, this is the same thing, but this is TEM scanning, this is SEM scanning. So, so the idea is to have this gold plated and then load it with a protein, Cray protein, and at the same time, Pioneer provide us with a transgenic maze line. That transgenic maze line carry this single gene insertion. This single gene insertion looks like this. A promoter drives a GAT gene, which is a, a, a glyphosate resistant, this is a selectable marker. And you have a promoter drive the uh, sign uh, CFP, blue protein, and uh, you have a piece of a red, Frozen's protein, and then in between, you have a LOX P, LOX P here. So in theory, if the Cray protein is working, that two LOX P will recombine, and then this promoter will start to drive the, the DS gene, right? So if upon bombardment, if the Cray protein is delivered into this transgenic, blue transgenic cone, we should see some sector of the red cell because this is because of a Cray protein is working and then make the LOXP recombine and then delete the middle part of the segment, the blue gene, blue gene deleted and red gene the hooked up with promoter and express. So this is what we actually found that we were able to see transiently the red and then the stable red cone callus. And then you have this segregating um, uh, red callus, uh, the, the cone callus. Look, the half of them are the blue and half of them are the red. Camerism. And then you have also this uh, tassel. This is the original transgenic cone. You can see it's blue. It shines in the blue channel, but not in the red channel. This is the, after recombined, the blue color is gone, and the red expressed there. So, oh, exciting. Recombinates working, that's. <laughs> So, grand finale, that, 
then we uh, take all these recombina uh, recombination, uh, rec recombine the lines, and then make the sequencing. And then they have, they really had a beautiful, precise excision, every single line of them. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, so these, the, the original, uh, the, uh, the, the sequence and uh, after the uh, LOX P recombi uh, recombined, uh, fused together, and then these are the um, protein bombarded line, and these are the plasmid bombarded line, because we also introduced DNA as our control. Well, DNA introduced the line, and then protein introduced the line, they result the same. And so that was a quite fun things to do, and that we show that we can deliver protein and recombinase and then make it working in the plant and exactly the place it's supposed to work. So that was uh, one illustration or the demonstration of the protein can be delivered uh, for future nucleus aided uh, genome editing. Um, so very final five, uh, five minutes about, okay, MS delivery and it's great and it, but it has this disadvantage. So what's the problem here? You have advantage is that control relief. And the major advantage that we use this particular type of a nanoparticle, it's a pore size limitation. So after we deliver a cray protein, everybody is happy. And same time, everybody starts to say, oh, it's a too small the size because the pore size is only 10 nanometer. That's the highest that we can push with the current formula. And so if we are going to uh, deliver talent or the CRISPR, all of them are much higher than the pole allow us to upload. And also this encapsulate the protein release may be too slow for us what we want. So at the same time, so we'll say, okay, well, you know, nanoparticles are great, and can we think about something else? Um, well, here is something else, as we, we co coined it, we call it called proteolistic. So it's a bombarded uh, method for intracellular delivery of protein only. So um, in this case, we just simply modify our current DNA delivery system by lingophilizing the protein, or air dry the protein onto the carrier, and then bombard. So, um, depends on protein we use, and we are able to introduce a variety of the protein. In this case, we have a GFP introduced, and we, have to, we also use a Tritsy labeled BSA, which is a rather large uh, um, protein. The reason we use those things is because they are cheap. They are color, colorful and cheap, and then BSA, uh, GFP is way too expensive. And then we also bombard the GUS enzyme, um, that allow us to uh, also be able to show that actually can turn the blue when you put the substrate there. And then we also uh, bombard some of the enzyme, uh, such as the trypsin and the RNAs, because once you bombard those uh, destructive uh, uh, enzyme, you should see the cell death in this case. So looks like we can bombard a variety of uh, DNA just by, uh, or the protein, just by through them in. And that's one of the thing uh, we have been doing uh, using the protein delivery, and uh, we also bombard the um, animal uh, tissue. And in this case, try to broaden our patent claim, right? Just demonstrate that we can do it more than um, plant cell. Uh, these proteolistic can be used to co deliver DNA and protein at the same time. Um, it's a very simple procedure. Um, you use a current existing gene gun, and it's quite reproducible in our hand. Very simple. Um, no restriction on the protein type, and can deliver protein and enzyme uh, with a different molecular weight and iso uh, uh, electro point, all the tertiary structure. The major part disadvantage to us is probably you cannot control release. You bombard, that's it. So. Um, with that, I will thank um, my colleagues in the um, plant transformation uh, facility and 
We also have a group of people who work on small uh, agroactive non-coding RNA. Then the nanoparticle work was a collaboration with uh, chemistry department as well as Pioneer. And our current funding for this particular project that come from uh, internal and then Pioneer uh, collaboration project. Thank you very much. So that gene is very close and conversion with your gene. So possibly the your gene transfer service reading through? Well, we thought about that. We actually looked into that. It's not it's not the read through actually. There's a quite uh, uh, significant and quite uh, clear stop after the AG. Yeah, we thought about that. It's a real through. Um, yeah. We didn't test this little uh, the putative promoter area. It's a very, very nice promoter area, but we don't know if it's a true restart. We haven't tested this area true promoter or not, but it's a potential promoter area that we have talked about. So in the other plasma, there's a massive IS element between the two and the Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So right now we try to decouple. So we have a promoter drive the top part, and then we have a promoter drive the bottom part. And hopefully that will help us understand, because we cannot believe them. We, we have to overexpress, and so we decouple them by drive top strand, bottom strands, <coughs> whether there is any correlation, right? So that's a... Have you achieved nuclear localization of one of these uh, proteolistically delivered proteins? We never try to test with a nuclear localization. We didn't put a nuclear localization signal. Oh, you are talking about uh, the protein, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks to me like they, they get in and they diffuse throughout the cell, so I would think they go into the nucleus just fine. But that's good that's question. That's we never would actually look into where they are focusing or get into the nucleus localization or not. So you expect the protein go into nucleus? They no, I'm just wondering. You know, if you're, if you're trying to deliver Cas9, it's got to get to the nucleus, right? And, and whether that would go in by chance just by being bombarded all the way to the nuclear membrane, or you probably could system. just uh, um, have a Cas9 have a nuclear localization yeah. signal synthesize it together with that, right? So if they have that, then for sure they will go in. They will go in and put the VND of whatever that near protein that we have nuclear localization, the VND2 promoter will guide you into sure. the for sure. Higher efficiency, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Tom. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.